Are you feeling exasperated and helpless about a friend or a family's member's addiction? Have you had your own battles with addiction? Our topic today is loving an addict and loving yourself. The top 10 survival tips for loving someone with an addiction. Our guest will be Candace Platter on Agree or Disagree, the podcast. Welcome, everyone, to Agree or Disagree, the podcast. You know me. I am Kevin Olenek. We are, of course, are the podcast that you can find on Facebook, uh, Spreaker.com, K-E-V-O-L-E, SoundCloud.com, K-E-V-O-L-E. Find me on YouTube as well, Kevin Olenek. Add me as a friend, as a friend on uh, Facebook, uh, Kevin Olenek. You can like, agree, or disagree the podcast on Facebook as well. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, uh, at K-E-V-O-L-E. We are the controversial podcast that pushes you to, to think differently and connects you with your community. We typically meet every Wednesday and Thursday. We did one earlier today, so this is the second podcast that we did today, so typically two a week. Sorry we missed yesterday, but that's okay. Uh, this is not a topic that I have talked a lot about myself, I admit, and I think it's a really important uh, topic to talk about, and it's the topic of addictions. We've uh, Some have dealt with them in our own personal life, uh, whether that be drinking, drugs, gambling, food, number of different options, or you have known someone that has had a, stru- a struggle with them. And you've noticed, you've had an issue with noticing the problem, admitting the problem, and taking the actual steps to recover or improve. It is an absolutely draining process and all involved. It can ruin friendships. It can ruin families. It has ruined relationships. It has ruined jobs. It has ruined lives. What do you do? The priority becomes about that person's addiction. They are the focus. They are the energy. They are the time. You try to balance that out with healthy boundaries for your own life, and that they tend to get lost, and you forget about yourself. You forget to think about yourself or care about yourself. Our guest today is going to help us with dealing with this tough topic. She is the author of the book, Loving an Addict and Loving Yourself, the Top 10 Survival Tips for Loving Someone with an Addiction. Her name is Candace Platter. She is a registered clinical counselor. And her quote is, if nothing ever changed, there would be no butterflies. Candace, welcome. Thank you, Kevin. How are you? Hello, everyone. Pardon me? I said, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Maybe tell us a little bit. Let's start about your, you have a really, you come out of this from a very different experience and a very personal experience, if if you you can see on your website. Uh, So tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got to where you are. Okay. Um, Well, I think the, uh, the really, my story really starts in the early 70s. Um, when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which for those people who don't know is an inflammatory bowel disease, unfortunately, a lot of people have it now. Um, so most people know what it is, but, um, at the time that I was diagnosed, it was really the new kid on the block disease and the doctors really didn't know what to do with me. They had this young woman coming into their office in tears, upset, in pain, depressed, um, because basically my life just stopped. I mean, it's a, it's a really debilitating illness to have, especially when it's, uh, when it's flaring up a lot. So the, and, and also in their defense, um, in the seventies, addiction wasn't on the radar the way it is today, for sure. Um, and so I don't think that the doctors really knew what they were unleashing upon me at that point. 
what they did was they, because they didn't really know how to treat this, they threw medication at me, lots and lots of medication, different ones that were mostly all addictive. So they would give me as much Valium as I wanted, as much codeine, as much uh, oxys, different kinds of oxys, painkillers. And I discovered, rediscovered pot, which I had smoked socially uh, when I was in university. And um, that cocktail, you know, went on for months and years. And I just took everything the way I was supposed to. I don't even remember taking more of it than I was supposed to, but it didn't matter because all of those all of those substances are addictive in a person's system and my body got addicted to them just like anybody's would. So <clears throat> so if you fast forward 15 years, um, I guess the other piece of that is that all of those substances are depressants in a human system. Very, like alcohol is as well, a depressant. So after about 15 years of taking all of this, I was suicidal. I mean, I was depressed on steroids, and I had no idea what was going on with me because, as I say, addiction wasn't on the radar. Unfortunately, the doctors today um, know about these medications, and some people are still prescribing them, which, you know, don't get me started, right? <laughs> but but, uh, but at that point, you know, it was a different story. But, yeah, so I was, uh, I was very, very depressed. I remember being at work one day, lying down on a couch in the staff room because I wasn't feeling well, which was the, the par for the course at that point, um, and thinking that I had enough pills to kill myself. And if I timed it right no one would find me in time and I could just die. And, you know, that scared me a little bit, Kevin. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe uh, I should do something about that. So I left work and I, I, I came home and I picked up the phone and I called the Vancouver Crisis Center, which um, was the beginning of the beginning for me. Um, somebody there saved my life that night. I have no idea who it was and it doesn't really matter. Um, but somebody really helped me, and from there uh, I started understanding about addiction and um, going to 12-step programs, Narcotics Anonymous programs like that, and getting my life back. So today, <clears throat> sorry, I have a little bit of a throat thing going on today for those who are listening, um, but uh, <clears throat> today I have... 30 years clean and sober. Wow. I'll be 31 in uh, July. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And, it, you know, just one day at a time. I'm not sure where that where that time went, but, you know, I just didn't pick up the first one. So that means that I didn't pick up the next one. And I just, I just kept moving along into learning about myself and learning about addiction and decided that I wanted to um, to work in the addiction field. I was already working as a counselor at that point when I had that, that uh, breakdown. And in Vancouver, anyway, I'm not sure how it is in other places, but at that point you needed to be clean for three years before you could work in the, in the recovery field. So I waited my three years and was... Um, hired at an outpatient um, addiction counseling center in the downtown east side, a place called Watari, which still exists, wonderful place, very dedicated staff. Um, and I worked in the downtown east side with addicts and alcoholics for 16 years and got an education that I could never have gotten anywhere else about addiction and about counseling. Mm -hmm. And at one point, uh, what what started to happen was that the the clients um, families their their parents their spouses sometimes even their children were calling me just at the end of their rope like what could, I've tried everything what do I do to help him or her and 
at first I had no idea what to tell them because I'm a loved one as well of people with addiction. And um, I had never trained in this. I had no idea. But I just listened to their stories and and found that there were some very similar themes, some very similar patterns. So I started working with the loved ones and discovered that I really enjoyed doing that and I was very good at it and that there was very, very little help for the loved ones, the families of addicts. There's lots of help out there for addicts. If you have an addiction and you're listening in and you want help, please reach out. Um, even though there's been a lot of funding cuts, there's still plenty of help for people who want to get away from addiction. But for the loved ones, there's hardly anything. Hmm. So that's one of the reasons that I um, that I kind of built this into a specialty for myself because I knew it was really needed. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, especially in you know one of these days we'll get into a, a bigger conversation about the downtown east side. But there's certainly that's a learning experience in of itself. But you mentioned yeah. that there when when you were going for help, that there wasn't a lot of knowledge as there is now. What has changed? I mean, I know that it, that may seem like an obvious question to some, but from your personal experience, what has changed and what is still something that we're still kind of stuck with a little bit? You talked a little bit about, and there's still not a lot of help for the families, which we'll, we'll get into as part of this, this podcast. But what are some of the other things that we're we're missing out on or, or maybe some myths and, and misconceptions out there? Well, you know, the, the gold standard of, of addiction treatment, I think that needs to be looked at as well. I think there are some really wonderful treatment centers out there. We have some really good ones in BC and there are some, you know, all over the world who really work well with the addict. What's, what's missing is that, Okay, here's the scenario. The addict goes to treatment or rehab. Um, in Canada, we call it treatment mostly, and in the States, we call it rehab. But the, the, So the addict goes off to a treatment center um, for 30 days, 45 days, something like that. It costs about $50,000 in many places. So that's a, that's a problem because a lot of people don't have that kind of money. Uh, and it's really possible that at these centers, the addict starts to make some really good changes, starts to understand himself, herself, and, um, doesn't want to be in active addiction anymore. So, so they work on themselves and then at the end of their time, they come back to a family that hasn't been worked with because in most treatment centers, there isn't stuff going on for the family. In some, there's a little bit. You know, sometimes there's a week-long program where the families learn about codependency, they learn about enabling, you know, they, but there's nothing ongoing for them. So um, the addict comes back into a family that isn't receiving any counseling, isn't, doesn't understand what they're supposed to be doing really good people who are doing the wrong things because nobody's worked with them. The addict comes back into that same dysfunctional system and before very long generally relapses. And of course the family says, but we paid all this money, you know, and they don't understand why is this happening. And so when I started to understand that dynamic, I knew that I needed to work differently with addiction, with families, with the addicts. I no longer work with just a person with an addiction. If there, This is just me now. I know that a lot of people do, and I'm glad they do. Um, but for me, I don't work with anybody whose family isn't willing to be part of the treatment because everybody in the system is affected and everybody needs to heal. And in order for the transformation to happen that people want, every as many people as possible in a family need to be involved. Right. Yeah. I, and, and that's important. And we'll, we'll dig into that. And I think also one of the things that when you were talking that always strikes me and, um, is 
is there's a concept in part of the 12 steps about making amends. And the idea is, is the person coming, the person that is impacted by the addiction writes out a letter and says, this is how you have hurt me in this way and what your addiction, whatever it is, has done. But we, it, it, what I appreciate that about that is that there's a lot of atmospheric stuff that impacts the person that is in the addiction. And, and almost in a sense, what you're, you're almost saying is, is the atmosphere around the person needs to make amends the other way as well, because it's a relational, relational thing. Is that what you kind of, what I'm, I'm picking up? Would you agree with that or? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent I do. And, um, I think that, that amends are really good things to do because they do hold people accountable. And I think people need to be held accountable and, and then they need to move on after that, they need to move on. <laughs> but um, because, you know, too many people stay stuck in the past, which we can't do anything about, can't change anything there. Uh, but so in the 12 step program, step eight is to make a list of all the people that you've harmed. And step nine is to make those amends, except when to do so will injure them or mm. others. That's how it's written. Right. Um, but what it doesn't say in that step, which I think needs to be in there, is we make a list of all the people we have harmed and the people who have harmed us. Mm. You know, because <clears throat> most people who are uh, struggling with addiction have had some trauma in their lives. And, and that needs to be looked at too. That needs to be honored, right? So I think that uh, there are some amends that family members need to make to the addict. There are some amends that the addict needs definitely needs to make to the family. I can see it from both sides because I've been in active addiction for a long time before I cleaned up. Um, and I'm also a family member. So I know that both of these things are really important. Hmm. Yeah. So let's... Um, I, before I get into this, I, I'm kind of curious, what are your opinions on the 30 to 45 day you go to the rehab center? What What are your thoughts on that process? Are you, is it a good process to, to do? Is it, is there some tweaks that could be involved in that? What do you, what do you think of that? I think it's outdated. I don't, I mean, I don't think it, it's not long enough, first of all. You don't make your changes in 30 days. You don't make your changes in 45 days. It's it's not long enough. And the amount of money that people have to come up with to mortgage their home again or sell everything they've ever owned, it, it just – it's it's a, a kind of a, a horrible system in that way. The, the people who work in the treatment centers are such dedicated people. They – Many of them have are in recovery and have gone through what they are asking their clients to go through, which I think is very healthy. I don't think you can take anybody anywhere that you haven't been yourself in terms of therapy. Um, I think good stuff can happen there, but as a standard, it's not long enough and it's too expensive. Mm. And And we need to have more... You know, so so much funding has been cut from education, prevention, and treatment. There aren't enough detox beds anymore. There aren't enough government-funded uh, therapy beds for people who are on welfare or people who just simply don't have $50,000 to, to throw around. Um, so I, I have mixed feelings around it, but I, but I don't. I don't, I know it isn't long enough. And, mm. and the program I have, which maybe we can talk about at some point today, yeah. uh, is, is very different. It's very different from what the treatment centers offer and it's cheaper. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us what the difference between what you're providing and what is currently going on. Get, let, let's get into it. It's about you, Candace. So let's talk about you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, in my life, I don't talk much about me. I'm always listening about other people. So it's kind of fun. Um, so what I did a couple of years ago, uh, was that I put together a program that helps families get their lives back from the ravages of addiction. I absolutely believe, I know without a doubt 
that we can stop addiction in its tracks if we stop the enabling that goes along with it. And we live in a very enabling society as well. And you can really see that in, in political arenas, especially in the states where, you know, certain politicians are enabled and they get to do whatever they want because they're enabled by other people. It's a very addictive um, society. And it's like that in so many places. If we could stop that and start getting healthier around stuff like that, and when we can stop enabling in the family, the addict starts to get better. But why would an addict who is being enabled, and when I use the term enable, uh, my, my definition of that is an enabling behavior is one that keeps the addiction going, mm -hmm. like giving money to an addict. You know where that money's going to go. If, if an addict needs food, give him some food, but don't give him money because if you give him money, he's, he, she, uh, I don't mean to be sexist here, um, is, is going to go buy drugs or alcohol or gamble or do whatever the addiction is. So, um, when we allow and encourage by enabling an addict to stay in active addiction, I don't see that as a loving act. I just don't see how that can be a loving act. And often loved ones are doing that because of their own needs, because, you know, they're afraid that, you know, if my loved one is on the street, something might happen to them. And of course they're right. Sometimes people have to have those kinds of consequences in their lives. So what I do is I work with the families to change what they're doing so that the addict can change what they're doing. Because as long as you keep enabling an addict, most of them will continue to use whatever the addiction is. Addiction, the way I see addiction, it's a, it's a progressive condition. It progresses. It doesn't get better without some kind of treatment. It doesn't get better on its own in most cases. It gets worse and worse and worse. So if you're enabling your addict to stay in active addiction, you're just making that person worse and worse and worse. And so family members need to understand that and have sometimes have their hand held while they're figuring out what their boundaries are, how to language those, how to set those, how to maintain them in times when things get rough. Um, addicts don't like hearing the word no, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing, and it takes a little time. So if you think about it, you know, you've got an addict in a treatment center who comes back to a family that's going to enable them. How's that going to work? Right. It's, it's, you're bringing them back into the – it's almost like you're bringing them into a hand grenade situation where it's – where where you're in one situation and then you're you know where it's completely clean or healthy or or whatever word you want to describe it and you're putting them back in a situation where it's almost like a shock especially if you've been yeah. gone for a lengthy period of time it's it's a culture shock and yeah it's a it's a step back it's what? and it can be very triggering and that's another point that you bring up when people go to treatment go to rehab quote unquote they have to um, leave their lives. They have to leave their jobs, their families. They have to go somewhere. And on one level, that can be a good thing. That could be a good thing to get them out of the playground that they've been in, you know. But it, it, the program that I have is a six month um, program. Sometimes I work for three months and sometimes I work for a year with a family, depending on what's going on. But usually most people like the six month program. Um, and and I work with them wherever they are in the world. I have clients everywhere in the world. It's, it's, uh, I love Skype and I love, <laughs> you know, Zoom and all these things that, uh, ways that I can be with people in Australia or in Hong Kong or in England, uh, as well as different places in Canada and the States. And, and what I do is I work with them kind of where they are. 
so they don't have to leave their lives. Hmm. They can stay in their lives and learn what they need to learn. And um, often when I start working with a family, the addict isn't quite ready to work with me. So I help the family get the addict ready to work with me. In fact, most of the time, the person who's addicted is pretty angry with me because I'm changing the rules of the game. And I'm doing that because I love and respect addicts and want them to live, you know. Um, so, so it's just a very different, you know, they don't have to go anywhere. They don't have to shell out all this money and they can talk to me about rates and things. They call me, I, I offer a free 60 minute phone consultation. We can talk about that too. Um, so it's a, it's just a very different way of looking at it, working with the whole family system and, and, allowing them to have the transformation as a family that they really want. So, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. So let's talk about the decision to get help. Let's say I am addicted. I'm not, I don't have a, one of those. I, I, I don't need help in that way, but I, there it's the step is in in there where one needs to call you or one needs help. Mm-hmm. How, how does one get there? Yeah. I, well, I think you used just a brilliant word when you asked that question. And what you said was the decision to get help. So the way I see addiction uh, and it's a little different than most people see addiction and it's different than what the dogma has been for a very, very long time. Some, uh, there are more people now who are um, agreeing with what I talk about, and that's that's very nice for me because I've been the lone voice for a while here in Vancouver. Um, I, I don't see addiction as a disease per se. I have a disease. I have Crohn's disease. I know what having a disease is like, and I can't say – gee, I think I just won't have Crohn's disease anymore. I mean, if I could do that, man, that would be wonderful. But that's not how it works with diseases, with real illnesses uh, like cancer and diabetes and things like that. I know that there's brain involvement with addiction, of course. There's there's physiological, biological um, things that happen with addiction depending on the addiction. Of course that's true. But addiction is a symptom, and sometimes it's a very devastating symptom, and sometimes it kills people, unfortunately, especially with uh, fentanyl being out there. But addiction is a symptom of what's underneath it. And if we don't get underneath what the addiction is all about, why the person needs to continue to shoot themselves in the foot, then it will never end. We have to understand why we're doing it. And loved ones need to understand why they're enabling because they're they're doing some codependent behaviors. Often the loved ones are what I call addicted to the addict's Mm. addiction. You know, that's what they think about. That's what they talk about with each other. That's what they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning worried about. They're having a hard time at work because they just can't think about anything else. And that's not helpful, right? If I thought that would help an addict recover, I would tell them to just even do more of that. But that's not what works. So we need to change that around. So I see addiction, mostly I see addiction as a choice. And I I don't mean that people choose to be addicts. I don't think anybody chooses that. I know I didn't. I don't think anybody gets to a place and says, gee, let's be an addict. That'll be fun. You know, that's not the choice I'm talking about. The choice I'm talking about is that in every single addict's life, every addict I've ever met and myself included, we get to a point where we, we look at our lives and we know that we're a mess. We look at other people who are, 
um, you know, holding down jobs and they have families that are thriving and their, their relationships with people are good and, you know, they're pretty healthy, the people that they look at. And, and we look at ourselves and not much of that is going on for us. And that's, so and that's, that's when we know that, this is, an, this is an addict and active addiction, when we get to that place of seeing that, that is the choice point. Am I going to stay in active addiction or am I going to, to go into some kind of active recovery, 12-step or any, whatever? There's a number of different alternatives now. That is the choice point. And unless a person makes the choice to recover, they don't recover. And the other thing I really want to raise is that I don't, I don't believe for a second that the family has created the addiction, has caused the addiction, because addicts make their own choices, and it doesn't matter what the family has done. It doesn't matter what, you know, how bad it's been or how good it's been, or it doesn't matter. The addict is making his or her own choices about how to respond to life. So the loved one isn't responsible for making the addict change, which you can't do anyway. You can't make anybody else change. What they need to do is stop any behavior that's contributing to the addiction continuing, because that is on them. Okay, more to unpack here. So, uh, I think the, the first question that's coming to my mind, there's a couple of things I want to unpack here. You talked a little bit about the underneath, but I'm curious when someone comes to you, what if, because there, there are probably people out there that are like, you know what, I have a problem and I need to fix it. There's also people out there that is, I have a problem and I can't fix it. Right. Well, that's what people are taught. They're taught that they're powerless over this. But of course, that's not true. Because if that was true, I wouldn't be 30 years clean and sober. Mm. And neither would anybody else with any kind of active recovery for any length of time. We choose it every day. How do you get to the place of this, from the place of despair to the place of hope, or from the place of, you know, that's who I am, Candace. I am a drunk. That's I'm Kevin and I'm a drunk and there's nothing that we can do about it, Candace. That's who I am. So Dude. so I would say to you, well then why are you calling me? What do you want? What are you looking for? So you're not forcing people to to come to you necessarily. It's 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 on them, but it, it's Yeah. You know. <laughs> I can't force anybody to do anything. No. And this I I know that now, and that was a hard thing to wrap my head around because we live in a society that tells us that we can. Mm. If we act a certain way, somebody's going to feel a certain thing. We have so much power over other people. It's crazy. We don't have any power over anybody. Right. It's if, kinda... if, we, if we want somebody to do something and they do it, that's because they choose to do what it is that we want them to do. Yeah, I also imagine though that even the person that's coming to you and making that step, there's there's a lot of trepidation or fear or nerves or doubt or cynicism that what you're going to do for me, Candace, and what we're going to do working together is going to have me clean for thirty years or thirty days yeah. or thirty minutes. And how do you work through that with yeah. with the client? I'm curious well, about that. you know, one of the things we talk about is having a false premise, and the false premise that they have is that they can't do anything about this. Hmm. What if they what if they can? What if we do a little bit of work and they find that they can do something about this? What if they can make a different choice? What if? What would their lives be like if they weren't hindered by this addiction? Hmm. Or if they weren't a loved one waking up in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning, you know, what would life be like if if, if we could change this for you? Your fear when you come to me may be that you can't do anything about it, that you can't change it. I know that's not true, and I'll help you learn that that's not true if you let me. Hmm. If you yeah. allow me to help you, I will help you. You know, it was uh, someone was mentioned to me this week, week in a conversation, and just and when you're talking, this kind of reminded me because I imagine 
the nerves come up and nervousness, the, what she told me is excitement without breath. Mm. And I, I like that term. That's what, yeah. it, cause it's, it's, That's I, great. yeah. Cause I think, I think there is when people take, it's, it's a really courageous step, step in any way, shape or form to ask for it's help. It's so correct. It's so courageous to ask for help. Yeah. I teach people how to pat themselves on the back. Literally. Yeah. I teach them how to do that. Yeah. Literally like how to take their arm and stretch it out in front of themselves and bring it around and pat themselves on the back. Yeah. We need to do that more. Yeah. What, okay. Let's talk a bit about the family dynamic here. And, and in that case, because you, you're, you're in your book, you, you have the 10 steps. And one of the things that you, you talked about, you, steps. it's not, they're not steps. Or I 10, just want to be- <laughs> yeah, okay. it's not like the 10 steps, or, like the 12 steps. It's the 10 survival tips, survival, survival tips. strategies. Right. Sorry about yeah. that. Sorry about the word in there. That's, that's uh, okay. Uh, thank you for, for correcting me. What is the difference? You talked about this a little bit about enabling. What is the difference between helping and enabling? Yeah, that's such an important question and such an important thing to learn. So, um As I was saying before, an enabling behavior is something that keeps the addiction going. So the example that I used was giving an addict money. That's the most common one. Uh, I have had clients who have um, taken their addicts and driven them to the dealer to get their drugs. We don't have to do that anymore because addicts now can just call a dealer who will come to their home (laughs) has made, you know, they've made it so easy, but, you know, taking, taking and driving an addict to uh, an alcoholic to the liquor store to pick up their liquor, to pick up their addiction. Um, And, and I've, you know, I've talked to them about this, like, why are you doing this? And, they say, well, at least I know where he is. He's not under the bridge shooting up. Hmm. So, but it's not a good idea to be doing this with an addict. It's not a good, it's not good role modeling. It's not, a, it's not a loving act to be doing this. So another thing that happens with enabling is, um, um, this is especially true with parents of, children and adult children mostly who allow them to live in the family home while they're in active addiction. So they're bringing in illegal drugs that people could get arrested for. They're um, bringing in some sketchy people. Maybe they're nothing much is is expected of them. The bar is set very low for them. So they're not expected to give back in any kind of real way to the family even though they're living in the home with everybody, they are allowed to sleep all day and party at night. Um, they're allowed to be raging and punch holes in walls and call people terrible names and, um, you know, sometimes even push and shove people. That's allowed. The loved ones allow that to happen because they just don't know what else to do. Mm. They don't know what else to do. This is the problem. So, that's all, all of that stuff is enabling the addict to continue using the addiction. And sometimes they, they pay for, you know, different things that the addict doesn't have money for because he's spending all his money on drugs, for example. So it's, it gets very cushy sometimes for these addicts that are in active addiction to just stay there. So a helping behavior yeah. is is something that assists the addiction to stop. So an example of that would be to say, um, you know, if you're if you're in that situation where the addict is living in your home and you say to them, it's not okay with us anymore to to have you sleep all day and party at night and to not even put your dishes in the sink. You know, it's not okay with us that you're not doing anything with your life, that you're not working, that you're not volunteering anywhere, that you're not going to school. You need to be doing one of those three things if you want to live here. You you need to be contributing to the household and you're not allowed to call me any terrible names anymore. There needs to be respect. So the family needs to start respecting themselves enough to expect this 
from the addict. And that's usually where it starts, is that the loved ones need to start respecting themselves more. Hmm. I imagine. Well, can I just finish the yeah, thought? Of course. So, it's, so the message that the family needs to give to the addict that they love is we love you. We love you so much. We're sorry that we've been enabling you. We didn't understand until now. Now we understand what enabling is about, and we know that that wasn't good for you, and we're sorry. You're making amends. We're sorry we did that to you, and we're not going to do that anymore because we love you. So now, the, you know, if you're, if you're still needing to be in active addiction, if that's your choice, you're going to need to do that somewhere else. But when you're ready for help, when you're really ready, let us know because we love you and we'll be here for you when you're willing to meet us halfway. How do you overcome the guilt of saying no? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Um, well, feel free to say some more. Uh, you see, the I need money. Or else I'm not going to eat. I'm going to starve. No. You can't. I can't do it. Because I know what that money is going for. Or I am assuming what that money is going for. Um, however you want to look at that. How do you overcome that guilt, though? Of putting someone through... Or... Be, you know, not necessarily helping them in the situation where they... Not feeling that you're helping them, but you are actually helping them. Yeah. And it's a the tough love thing. It is tough love. And and that's what people say to me, you know, who are still yeah budding with this, is that they say, Oh, that's just tough love. And it is. It is tough love, and tough love is love. And if until you stop enabling and until you put in a little bit of tough love, nothing much is gonna change because if nothing changes, nothing changes. Right. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Right. And then, so we need, to, we need to change something up. Okay. So the question you ask is fantastic, and it's about – this is why I work with families. This is exactly why I work with families, because I help them to understand what this guilt is about. I help them look at it and see it and see it for what it really is and – um, often family members um, of people with addiction have grown up in families with addiction. Hmm. And so their triggers are quite real and, and very scary for them. And uh, they, they don't know how to handle that. And they need somebody to hold their hand through that. And that I can do that. That's what I do. Right. right? So, so we look at what is it that's, that's, Needed, what need of yours is being met by you enabling your addict? And if you are saying no, you know it's the right thing, but something inside of you is telling you it's the wrong thing, what do you do with that? That's where working with the family comes in for me. That's mm. what it's all about. That's the, therape the, the therapeutic aspect of what I do. What... Yeah, and this is it's interesting to to hear this. How, how do you the, the next thing that's coming up in my head here is about the the ups and downs of recovery. And I I, I imagine you know this for in your own life too for 30 years of dealing with this and how do you deal with the 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 times of you know what we're going really really well and things are going awesome and we're on the path of we're on the path to success, and then all of a sudden there's a, a left and a right turn, and there's a stumble of some kind, whatever that is. And then it, it's it's down for a bit, and then it comes back up, and then it goes down. How do you deal with that? How do you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically deal with that? From, well, a, from an addiction perspective, from your own addiction perspective, but from an in-family perspective, how does that... Yeah. I, I remember... A time, there were probably more than one time, too, uh, when I, in my early recovery, I was lying on my living room floor in the fetal position, just feeling like, you know, just kill me now, 
because I just can't keep doing this. I can't keep feeling what I'm feeling. We use addiction, whatever the addiction is, to feel better or at the very least to feel different. Most people use it to feel better. They think that they're going to feel better by doing this. They don't want to have to feel those terrible feelings they've always been feeling. And so they use something to blot them out. Um, what we learn in recovery, one day at a time, one second at a time, is that, yes, we can feel these feelings and survive them and even understand them and even grow from them. And they're not such a bad thing after all. And they don't have to take us down and they don't have to take us out of recovery. Hmm. But, you know, sometimes people need help with that. You know, they, they it's hard to do it all by yourself. So, um, so I, I know that the bad times are part of the good times. The good times and the bad times, they come together. They're together. It's a package, <laughs> you know, and I know that. And I believe in a person's ability always. I always believe in somebody's ability to be able to get through what feel like the bad times without having to block themselves out. If they don't want to, I mean, I... I got to such a low bottom, I signed myself into the Vancouver VGH uh, site board because I was afraid that if I had my clothes and my car keys and whatever, my drugs, I was going to kill myself. And I was in there for like four weeks in the site ward mm. at the end of my using. And it, it was only because there were Narcotics Anonymous meetings across the street at that time and somebody in the hospital who was also trying to come off drugs and alcohol took me to those meetings that things changed for me. But I was in the psych ward. You know, I know what that feels like. And I stayed clean. Yeah. I, had, I had very little family support along the way while I was watching other people have a lot of family support. And I stayed clean. I had an illness that was painful beyond belief sometimes, and I stayed clean. Now, I'm not trying to say, you know, I walked all those miles in the snow. I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to say that when we make the decision to not use anymore, we don't have to use anymore. And there are people like me out here who can help you do that. Yeah, it's a choice. It's a choice. It's a, yeah, it's a, and an important step. And if, again, if you guys are out there and this point in our podcast, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about resources in a, in a moment here, but it is hopefully if we, if, if it impacts one person, Candace, I think we've done our job today. Oh, definitely. And, uh, you know, if you're listening and you've been feeling hopeless, please, please don't give up. Mm. Don't give up. Mm. Don't give up. Yeah. Reach uh, out, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And one of the things that I did when I when I could when I could say my name again, you know what I mean? Like when I could when I could think clearly is I volunteered for the Vancouver Crisis Line because I, I wanted to give back what I had gotten. And, and it's, it's really good to help other people. And if you're out there and you're listening and, and you want to recover from addiction and you really want to recover from addiction, we need you. We need you. Hmm. You know, hmm. come be with us. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that you talk about in the book and in your videos as well is the power of self care because, and you talk about the idea of the boundaries and taking the time away from the situation where it's not so much about the addict, but it's about you as a person that's helping. Can you elaborate on that? Because I feel it's very important for people to know that if they're in this situation as well, the, the importance of self care in, in this. You know, I, I work, with a couple. Um, I, I've been working with them for quite a while, but I, I don't see them often anymore because they're doing really well. Their daughter 
um, is in the downtown east side. Uh, she lives there now, and that's her life, and it's it's very sad. And um, they see her maybe once a month, and um, they 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 wish that she would choose something different, but they know they can't make her do that. And they um, they go on vacations. And, and, and they have a good marriage and they don't wake up at three o'clock in the morning anymore, not able to go back to sleep. They have learned how to take care of themselves. And as sad as the situation is, because not all addicts choose to recover, but the family can still be healthy. Yeah. We do the best we can to work with the addicts, and most of the time they choose recovery. Most of the time when the enabling stops, that's exactly what they choose. Sometimes it doesn't. And the self-care that's involved in the family, it's such good role modeling for the addict as well. It's like, I'm going to take care of myself, and if you want to take care of yourself in a healthy way, let's do it together. You know. But it's the, it's the classic thing of being on the airplane and – and the flight, the flight attendant talking about the masks that are going to fall down if there's turbulence. And they always tell you whose mask to put on first, don't they? Yeah, the other person's. No. Oh, yours. That's right. Don't put on the other person's. Don't put listen on, to my advice. <laughs> you put on your own mask first, first yeah. because if you can't breathe, how can you help anybody else breathe? Hmm. And that's the analogy that I use for that. So mm. you need to learn how to breathe. You need to learn how to take care of yourself. And from that place, you do what you can to help somebody else. But what, what most loved ones have done, and often out of the kind of guilt you were talking about, guilt and fear and shame and all kinds of things, um, they put their own needs on the back burner and, you know, none of their needs get met. Everybody gets sick. Everybody's sick in the family. The dynamic is twisted up, and we need to untwist it. Hmm. Talk about – we'll get into the book here in a, in a, in a couple seconds here. Two more questions, and then we'll talk a little bit about your, your, the book. Codependency. Can you elaborate on – because – there's there's that there's the codependency and the feeling that you have to control the addict control the situation you know if we put this in front of this person then they won't do this anymore as opposed to just stepping back and trusting the process and how do you balance that in terms of the codependency balance of that yeah it's a it's a hard one at the beginning um trusting the process is really hard for people who have loved ones who are potentially killing themselves. It's, a, it's just a hard one. Um, but the reality is that we don't control anybody else, try as we might. And one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is the serenity prayer. That's a prayer that most people know, especially if you've been to any 12-step meeting ever, anywhere. <laughs> they all end with the serenity prayer. And they usually say it really fast. God grant me the serenity, except things kind of change, you know. And, and um, I heard that prayer for years in these meetings and started to think about, well, what does this really mean? So I unpacked it. And, you know, it, God, whatever God means to you, religious, spiritual, walking on the beach with your dog, you know, whatever it means to you. Grant me the serenity, the peace, the contentment, which, you know, if you're the loved one of an addict, you don't feel very much of. The addict gets to blot out if they're using mind-altering substances, but you don't get to, you know. So you're not feeling a lot of, a lot of peace or contentment or serenity. So grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And I look at this with my clients, like, what can't you change? Well, you know, you can't change the weather. You can't change how quickly or slowly time passes. You can't change lots of things. 
and and the reality is that you can't change anything outside of you. I had a client once who told me that because um, I said to her, you know, if, if the if you want the grass to be purple, it's still going to be green. And she said, well, I could paint the grass purple. Hmm. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty creative, but it would still be green, you know. So then the next line is the courage, and it really does take courage, the courage to change the things I can, because the only thing we can really change is us. The only person you can change is sitting on your butt. That's it. Hmm. Hard one for people. And the last part of the serenity prayer is the most important part of all. It's the wisdom to know the difference. If we don't have the wisdom to know the difference between what we can change and what we can't change, guess what we're going to do? We're going to spend lots of time and energy trying to change things that we can't change. Hmm. And get constantly frustrated. Constantly frustrated. Angry, frustrated, enraged, just... And... What kind of a life is that? Yeah. It's not a good one. Things can be so different. You know, yeah, very important point. And it's good that we broke down the serenity prayer. I think that, that's oh. that's important, I think. It's a beautiful piece of writing. I, I, I just bow to the person who wrote it. Mm-hmm. You know, normally this would be a question to ask at the top, but I really intentionally wanted to leave this for closer to the end. It, because I, th- I, th- and you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think, I think we need to elaborate what is an addict? Because I, I think we, we've painted this as, well, it's the alcoholic, it's the gambler, it's the smoker, it's well, the drug addict. Help- we change it to what is the what is an addiction? Let's do that. What is an addiction? Yeah, let's take it away from the person and, yeah. and, and look at what an addiction actually is. And I like that because because addict is 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 sort of an identity word, it's, which is a pro and a con, isn't it? In some ways. Well, some people don't like it. I when when I was told that I was an addict, when I realized that I was an addict, for me that label was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because then I could make sense of what was going on in my life. So I don't mind it, and I, I use it with great respect because I know that addicts are people, and, and they're having trouble in their lives. And that's what an addict is, is somebody who doesn't know how to deal with life. But if we, if we look at the addiction, sometimes we can – I think it might be easier to look at what an addiction is versus a habit, Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if so, an addiction is something, and there are just so many ways to have an addiction, right? Addiction is addiction is addiction. An addiction is something that's really um, negatively impacting your life. Mm-hmm. So, it's something that's getting in the way of your job. It's something that's getting in the way of you being healthy in your family, you having good relationships of, you know, being able to have money and save money and spend money and enjoy money. Um, it's, it's getting in the way of your health. It's, it's something that's really making your life miserable. And there's an element of feeling of powerlessness. Like I just can't stay away from whatever this thing is. There's that feeling. If you look at a, at a habit like biting your nails, which I used to do, so that was a habit. I would put my fingers in my mouth and I would bite my nails. Unless you're biting your nails down to your knuckles, nail biting isn't really going to be that big an issue in your life. And it's going to be fairly easy to stop if you make the decision to do that. Right. So addiction is a little harder to stop, and it's really getting in the way of what you probably really want to be living deep down. Yeah. Does that help? That does. And you talked about the underlying meaning of – can you talk, elaborate on that with that too? You talked a little bit about the underlying part of addiction. Yeah, I know. It, it, was, it was an interesting day uh, for me. When I realized that I had to work with clients around things like sexual abuse, 
I had to work with clients around things like, you know, things that were triggers for them, things that kept coming up for them. Because what the reason that we use an addiction is to keep all of that stuff down. And until we actually deal with it, it's still in there. It's kind of like the jack in the box. So you put all, you put everything in the jack in the box, you put it all down, you stuff it all down, you stuff it all down, you close the lid, and you go, whew, okay, I got it, I'm in control here, you know, and then it's do 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 pew. Hmm. When you least expect it, there it is. So we have to look at what's underneath. But we don't get stuck there. We don't get stuck there. I don't get stuck with clients in terms of what happened. We look at how we can heal that and move on. Mm. Mm. So tell but us. But it's about- real. It's real. What happened to people and what what has what has really gotten them is real. There are reasons for why people use addiction. There are reasons. What we don't want is for people to use them as excuses. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Own it. Tell us about the book. Tell us a little bit about the process of writing the book. Uh, tell us how you got there. And I really love Melody's. Uh, I got to give Melody Owen question uh, credit for this question, but as she asks it as part of. For those who don't know, uh, I go to a thing called YBR Authors that meets the every third Tuesday downtown Vancouver. So if you're an author, something check out there. But well, the question is, if you're not an author but you want to be an author, or even if you're in if you're in the process or you're just thinking about it but you really want to be, you can come too. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone mm-hmm. that wants to do some writing of some kind, it's a great place to really connect people. And Melody does the, the question, and the question that she asks always is, what is the promise when you purchase the book? So tell us a little bit about the book, the the how you got there, and... And the promise for those that are going to purchase the book. Okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> That's a load. The you way, yeah. Um, the reason the book was written is that I knew as time went on and I was working more and more with loved ones and family members, I knew that I couldn't work with everybody who wanted to work with me. And I was getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of people wanted to work with me. And I just, because, you know, word of mouth spread and people were getting results. And <clears throat> and I, I knew that I, I had things to say that I wanted people to know about. And um, so I thought, I'll put, I'll put it down in a book. And I did. And um, I feel kind of like the book wrote itself, but... Um, one of the I remember when I was doing that interview with uh, with Melody that you know somebody was asking me a question and something about how do you write a book when you're really busy in your life and that was exactly my situation and what I learned how to do was I learned how to write in like five ten fifteen minute increments if I was waiting for a client and I had 10 minutes or mm. five minutes I would sit down and I would get a few things written and and the way that I wrote was to just write it and then look it over later. I didn't worry about it. I just wrote it. And then I look back over it later. Because otherwise we can be so perfectionistic that we'll never get it written. Mm-hmm. So um, it was really kind of a fun thing to do, but it was also painstaking in some ways. And it took a little bit of time. Um, took about nine months to write and then, uh, I decided to self publish and it was not at a time when most people were self publishing. It was at a time when people were looking askance at self publishers, a self published book was not nearly as good as a book that's published. Well, you know, that's, that was the, that was the feeling then, which has changed thankfully. Um, so really the reason that I wrote it was that I wanted more people than I could ever get in touch with and contact with and work with to know what I was teaching because it's working. <laughs> so, um, 
so the promise of the book, that was a really interesting question. The promise of the book is that you can stop addiction in your family forever. Mm. You just need to know how. And that's what the book's going to tell you. And that's what the book's going to tell you. And working with me is how you're also going to learn how to do it. But the book will tell you how to do it. And there's also a workbook that goes with it for the loved ones. So, you know, if you want to find out more about why you're saying yes when you mean no, why you're putting your, your, your needs on the back burner and feeling resentful and frustrated all the time, if you want to find out where that came from and get underneath it for yourself and be able to change it, the workbook can be very helpful. Awesome. And where do we find your information? How do we connect with you online? Well, the books are available at Amazon, mm -hmm. pretty much anywhere all over the world. By the way, the book has been translated into French and Estonian. Wow, that's awesome. Some, yeah, I know. Somebody contacted me from Estonia and said, can we translate your book? It was awesome. Um, <clears throat> so, so the books are available uh, at Amazon. They're also available in PDF form uh, on my website. And, um, you know, if, if there's somebody that would like me to send them a copy of the, like the link for the PDF, if you're, you know, wanting that, let me know. They can, um, they can contact me at www.candisplatter.com. And I'll spell that because everybody misspells both of my names. <laughs> it's C-A-N-D-A-C-E. And it's P is in Peter, L-A-T-T-O-R, so CandisPlatter.com. And, uh, yeah, you can just read about the work that I'm doing, and um, there's YouTube videos and yeah. all kinds of things on it and articles, and you can sign up for my newsletter and get uh, a free chapter of the book. Yeah, um, yeah so that's how. Awesome. Is there anything else we need to touch on before uh, we go? Or um, I don't think so. Well, there is one for for in in the book um, in survival tip number three. For each tip, I I used a quote from somebody else. They're not my quotes, mm -hmm. and this one really sums up what all of this is about. I think. So, so survival tip number three is that you cannot control or fix another person, so stop trying. Mm. And the quote comes from Robert Heinlein, who's a science fiction writer, and he wrote lots of wonderful books, but my favorite was always Stranger in a Strange Land, because that's always how I felt. If you haven't read that book, it's wonderful. And he says... Never try to teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and it annoys the pig. <laughs> so true. if you're trying to get your addict to change and you're trying to say, oh, well, you don't you have to stop using, don't do this, you kind of sound like the Charlie Brown cartoons of wah, 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 wah. So, you know, there's a different way of going about it awesome. that will probably make the addict change a lot faster. That's great. And that's what your book and that's what this topic is about. And we thank you, Candace, for joining us. You can find me, of course, on Facebook, Kevin Olenek. You can like, agree, or disagree the podcast on Facebook as well. You can add me as a friend, as I said, on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter at K-E-B-O-L-E. -E. Subscribe on YouTube, Kevin Olenek, SoundCloud.com, K-E-B-O-L-E. -E. Podbean at A or D, the podcast. We are this close to getting on iTunes and Spotify. Very close there. And, of course, also Instagram, Twitter, everywhere else, K-E-B-O-L-E. -E. Thanks again, Candice, for joining us. All right. We will talk to all of you soon. Bye for now. Bye.